Thanks very much to Emma and Alison for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm going to talk about the therapy of education from a more general educational point of view. Some things I say do overlap rather with what's been said so far, but I hope I can give a new angle to them. Now, uh, for long it's been seen that there's a relationship between mental health, education and philosophy, and this has been worked through in different ways at different times, given pro different prominence at different times. One thing I'm particularly interested in today, which uh, certainly Lucy has talked about, is the, whether mental health is needed in order to do well in education, or whether education should be contributing to mental health. Um, that will come up later in what I have to say. And we can think about other aspects of the triangle if you're interested as time goes on. So mental health as happiness, I think it's very widely accepted in many different countries now that um, mental health should be seen in relation to happiness, flourishing and well-being. And that well-being is the good that societies should be aiming at and that schools should be supporting in various ways. I want to just cast a couple of questions uh, about this, raise a couple of questions. So in contemporary usage, then, well-being uh, seems close to the ideas of flourishing and happiness. But flourishing applies to animals and plants where we know what it is to live well and to live healthily. I take it that's obvious, but I can expand on it if you wish. And actually, happiness tends to be understood in what I think is a rather constrained way, as was evident perhaps in some of the earlier talks today as well, it's understood in a primarily subjective way. It's to do with inner feelings. It's how I feel in relation to the world around me, outside me. Now, there is an older sense of happiness, which is mostly erased in modern usage, which connects to the idea of a rather old-fashioned word, happenstance, which means something like what happens to happen. It connects with the word perhaps as well, etymologically. And this, this suggests a kind of readiness for what happens to happen. Um, but this sense I'm suggesting in the modern notion of happiness is mostly lost. It does connect, I think, with Amor Fati that Richard was talking about and with thy will be done, inshallah, those notions of acceptance and of doing something as well as you can in these present circumstances that are here now with us. So in theorising about this, there's enormous amounts written on Aristotle and eudaimonia, and the modern translation of eudaimonia is usually taken to be well-being. And well-being, of course, has enormous prominence today. It's not just something we can accept in purely descriptive terms, because as with so many of these expressions we're looking at, and in education generally, the terms don't just have a descriptive value, they have a certain force, they function in slogans and policy documents, it becomes de rigueur to use them. So this difference then, I'm suggesting there is a difference between well-being and the Greek notion. I, I think personally it's a slightly, a somewhat depleted version of the Greek notion. It's more naturalistic and more subjective. So subjective relating to individuals and how they feel, naturalistic in the sense that the good for the human being is understood as the, nat as the satisfaction of natural desires. That doesn't just mean physical desires, but desires the person has to, happens to have. Now, it loses something of a more objective and morally focused sense of what it is to live well, which was there in the Greek tradition. So that to, to be in a state of eudaimonia would be to be attuned in some way to the reality of the world and to the lives of those you were living with as well. And Nietzsche has been mentioned several times, so I, my worry about eudaimonia, and I'm sure I will upset some people here in saying this, is that it actually reflects something of what Nietzsche described as nihilism. Nietzsche describes nihilism as various different stages, and the last stage of this, which he relates to the last man, the last human being, no, it's not um, sexist in German, um, the, the last stage of this is where the person desires a life of comfort and ease. The BMW to drive home in after the day in the executive suite. The gin and tonic at the golf club. The easy listening music playing to you. The pleasant TV programs you'll enjoy with your family. And of course you'll have a life insurance policy that assures you'll be happy and comfortable into old age. That's the last man, I think. 
And that, as I say, is the last stage of the degeneration of nihilism that Nietzsche was concerned to track. And rather like utopianism, utilitarianism, it dissolves the, I forget your phrasing, Richard, but something like the conflicts and struggles that our moral lives face us with. There, is, there are conflicts between goods. It's not, a matter, it's not a matter of putting everything into a kind of universal machine for bringing them together so that we can calculate them all together, as Jeremy, Jeremy Bentham thought. So moral conflict then, it doesn't deal well with that. Something's already been said about physical health and mental health, and there's no doubt that physical health can have an effect on mental health and vice versa, of course. So I don't want to deny connections, but it's the analogy between the two, the easy move from talking about physical health and then mental health, what gets lost in the process. Now, we have a fairly good idea what physical health is, uh, what the you know, blood pressure, what good blood, blood pressure is, what the good blood count is, and so on. And we can have a similarly good idea of what good health is for animals. We're less clear about what constitutes mental health, as again has become up several times already. With animals, we tend not to think about this too much, or at least we see it in much more simple behavioristic terms. The idea of physical health tends to be seen in terms of notion, uh, notions of equilibrium or balancing. And again, some of what Richard was talking about suggested that perhaps, you know, it's perfectly normal and good and appropriate for us not to have lives of pure stability and balance. Actually, Emma's got a paper, Emma's got a paper called Balance, I think, which is probably in, pu in publication this week online, I think. And that's a, a very good challenge to this acceptance of the idea of balance and equilibrium as goods for our, goods for our um, mental lives. Our experience of life is not always one of bal balance. Um, Sarah, you reacted to the, uh, I think it was a boy's comment about being heartbroken um, earlier on. I mean, it, it's right to feel extreme grief or extreme sorrow. Despair sometimes is perfectly understandable at least. And someone who doesn't feel those things seems to be dehumanized in some degree. So should our response always be balanced? I wanted to take it a bit further forward with a specific example from a, a short dialogue by D.H. Lawrence. I don't know precisely when it was written. My guess is between um, 1910 and 1930 when he died. So let's just look at this dialogue. What is he? A man, of course. Yes, but what does he do? He lives and is a man. Oh, quite, but he, he must work. He must have a job of some sort. Why? Because obviously he's not one of the leisured classes. I don't know. He has lots of leisure and he makes quite beautiful chairs. There you are then. He's a cabinet maker. No, no. Anyhow, a carpenter and a joiner. Not at all. But you said so. What did I say? That he made chairs and was a joiner and carpenter. I said he made chairs, but I did not say he was a carpenter. All right, then. He's just an amateur, perhaps. <coughs> Would you say a thrush was a professional flautist or just an amateur? <laughs> I'd say it was just a bird. And I say he's just a man. Oh, right. You always did quibble. It's fairly obvious, isn't it, that uh, Lawrence's target here is the idea that we sometimes reduce people to their roles. <coughs> we see people in terms of their jobs. It's a nice point if he was writing in 1910, let's say, whether he could have written this with woman instead of man in. I'll leave you to think about that one. Um, but you can see where that's going. So it's concerned with reducing people to identities given in spe specific descriptions, roles, <coughs> to profiling, in fact. And of course, we're rather addicted to profiling. This is just the profiling page from someone called Mark. And um, of course, what you find is the various relationships and recent activity, uh, pictures and so on. We learn a bit about this person's education, Harvard, I see, uh, computer science and psychology. That sounds like a good combination. And if we go a bit further, his schools and then something about philosophy at the bottom of the screen as well. I don't know what his philosophy is. So we're pretty addicted to this. And of course, it's even more true with young people as 
uh, younger people, sorry. It's even more true with younger people, as Lucy was bringing out. And there may be good effects to it, as well as harmful effects, so I'm not going to go into that. But what's interesting is that where you talked about the looping effect, uh, Lucy, what seems to be happening here is not just that others are giving labels to us, we're actually adopting our own labeling. We're creating this process. We're doing it to ourselves. A uh, kind of governmentality in the way that Foucault described, policing your own mind, your own ways of living, and so on. So we're familiar with profiling. I don't want to talk a lot about that because um, although Lawrence was concerned with this thing to do with identity, his concerns about what a human being is went far beyond this. And the worries he had about Western civilization and the forms of life that had been created through it were far more profound. And so we need to change the tone a little. So Western civilization then, so deeply rooted in this myth of creation. This is Michelangelo on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. And this myth of creation then, from the, it's like a comic strip, isn't it? One, two, three. From the early stage of being in the Garden of Eden in a kind of harmony with nature, simply in the flow of being, absorbed in what, in, in being, eating from the forbidden fruit, which is the tree of knowledge, and I think we can say language as well, and self-consciousness, so that cast out of the Garden of Eden, in their shame, they go away, and they're now detached in some way from that perfect kind of unity, that natural unity. They're detached from this in self-consciousness, partially separated from the world, because they're not just in the world, they're also reflecting on it, they're also partly detached from it, daydreaming, thinking of tomorrow, thinking of yesterday. They're not in the present in the way that the animals in the world are. So Nietzsche, oh, sorry, not Nietzsche, Lawrence. Lawrence was reacting to the kinds of repression of the human and the animal in the human. He was re reacting to the repression of this through the history of Western civilization, reacting to the fact that we do too much head stuff all the time. Head stuff always intrudes in what we're doing. We lost our more holistic, more animal nature. Self-consciousness, that's what I've said then is the problem. That's not just being embarrassed about something at some time, it's this self-awareness, reflecting on yourself, remembering, questioning, and so on, isn't it? And it's so deeply human, so deeply into us, isn't it? I'm gonna give you another poem. This time, Death by W.B. Yeats in the late 20s. I'm just going to read some of the lines. Nor, nor dread nor hope attend a dying animal. A man awaits his end, dreading and hoping all. Man has created death. Well, what can that mean? You know, things die, don't they? Trees die, rabbits die, and so on. Human beings die. So what's he reaching for in talking about this? He's reaching for the fact that for human beings generally there are moments when you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't get back to sleep and you have this strange sense that somehow, sometime, all this will end. You'll be nothing. You'll, you, it will all pass away. And that's a very chilling thought. You get back to doing things with other people and generally that's dispelled. All of us can intellectually entertain that now, but I guess it's not vivid for us in the way that it can be in the night when you wake up. But that requires this self-consciousness, doesn't it? It's not something the animal is going to do. Animals do not die they in, the, in the way that human beings do. They, they cease to exist. I'm actually borrowing from Heidegger here. He puts it like this in Being and Time, 1927. Of course he knows they cease to exist, but they do not die, he says. They're not mortal where mortality refers not just to the event of death, but to the awareness of this, its anticipation in the course of life. And many philosophers have suggested that it's this anticipation of death that actually gets point to what we're doing, gives point to what we're doing now. Because if you're, I don't know, preparing a lecture or uh, doing a PhD, you've got some sense that you must do this within a certain frame of time. Now, it can't be 100 years, can it? within a certain frame of time. And why are you doing that? Because you've got some idea of what you might do afterwards. And that actually comes down to our moments and our hours and how we fill them and how we conceive them. If we, have, if we carried on living forever, 
it's difficult to see how things would have the point that they do. And again, this is Heidegger, animals do not have a world. Human beings have a world, animals are world poor, and a stone is world less. So this makes us rethink our ways of understanding the location we are, the world we're in, not as something that's purely detached from us, purely material, on which human beings get layered as an extra dimension, but something that actually comes out of our interaction with the world, so that what we see is a product of our own physiology, our own interests, our own needs, whether it's stuff in the room here or stuff in, in nature. We notice things in as much as they impinge on our lives in some way, and it's out of that that we can then do physics, and Stephen Hawking can do theoretical physics and come out with those theories, which perhaps tell us something about how all this came to be. But that's on the back of the notion of the world, which is already meaningful, already significant. And what animals don't have it, they have environments. So the world comprises things that have been made meaningful, where meaning is constantly being reworked in our thoughts and words and actions. And I'm going to say a bit more about the humanities later on. But the humanities, across the range of them, are concerned with the meaning-making activity of human beings, whether it's waging war, for example, or writing poetry as another. And artwork, of course, as well. So, often, and quite rightly, there's a concern with being present. How is it we can live our lives in a way that we give ourselves to the present more meaningfully? And this is a complex notion, because if we think of birds, then I think it's reasonable to think of them in the trees, eating, passing on food, whatever it may be, absorbed in what they're doing, not worrying about tomorrow or remembering last Thursday. If we think of the students in a lecture, then of course you see the different reactions, and maybe some of them are absorbed in what they're listening to. Let's hope that's the case. But surely their minds will wander, sometimes to good effect, because they're stimulated by something that's been said in the lecture, and sometimes because they're looking up the results of a football game or something, sometimes because they're asleep. So being present for human beings is never the instinct-driven, pure present of animals. Memories of the past and our anticipation of the future the actual and the possible are always folded into the present for human beings. So it's complex, it's not simple absorption, it's not the thing that animals have, it's not the Garden of Eden. But this is not all bad because although there's this complex background, this dislocation, this not feeling fully at home, a situation of Unheimlichkeit in, uh, in Heidegger's phrase, although that's also the case, we can be absorbed in what we're doing and maybe some of those uh, people in the, the lecture are, maybe the lecturer is too. And you can think of some activities that human beings do where it seems that being absorbed, being in the zone, is of the essence. So there's Serena playing a backhand, but then of course it doesn't make sense to play a backhand unless you've got some notion of the game and winning points and winning games and winning the match and winning the tournament and becoming the best in the world and so on. So all of that story is folded into this absorption you see in this. It doesn't mean what it means otherwise. So just a few things then about philosophy and in classical Greece and its relation to therapy and education which I spoke about at the start. So Socrates confronts the questions, how should I live and what sort of society should we live in? In various ways, this is what Plato's writings, recalling the life and words of Socrates, this is what the, his concerns come back to. And these are fundamental questions for our lives, our politics. I'm very pleased people have been stressing politics in the course of this meeting. What we also find in ancient Greece, again in Plato, and developed more in the post-Socratic uh, uh, philosophies, is the idea of the care of the self, which is a phrase that Foucault has also taken up, wonderful lectures in the Collège de France in the years just before he died. And the care of the self, as I understand it, is certainly not an artistic matter. It's not a kind of self-therapy thing when I uh, try to get a nice state of equilibrium. I don't think we should see it like that. It's more to do with how I'm to live if I'm to live my life well, because I don't want to screw up. 
Okay, so many things I could do could mess things up. I'm not talking about having some grand ambition for a career, and perhaps I don't flatter the right person so I don't quite make it. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about all the harm that we ordinarily do in our actions with others and to ourselves. How, how we destroy the world even though we're trying to do something good with it. So how do I not mess up? And remember, I can't go it alone because even to be talking to you now, I've been brought up into a community with others. I wouldn't be a human being in the ordinary sense if I hadn't first drawn those words from the community with others. So I have to make sense of my life in my relationship with others. Making sense, that's what I said about, in connect, that's what I spoke about in connection with the humanities. Here it comes into me. How am I going to live this life that I've been given? So that is a highly charged responsibility then that human beings have, I think. So just a couple of comments about the 20th century, and of course this is ridiculously selective in the very limited time available. Wittgenstein then, he sometimes described his own philosophy, enormously influential philosophy, as a form of therapy. And the reason he said this, because he thought that the problems in thinking and in our living our lives often arose from our ways of theorising. He's generally not a theoretical philosopher. He's averse to theory. And he thought there were problems in, in, philosophy, in, in theorising in philosophy, but also, increasingly, he thought there were problems in psychology as well. Psychology, of course, comes on the scene only in the 19th century in its modern form. And he saw the returning of words to the ordinary circumstances of their use as a kind of therapy. And then, following on from the care of the self, Pierre Adot and Michel Foucault, influenced by Adot, um, uh, they both thought that academic philosophy had become detached from something that was important to it in ancient Greece, that it was not just about solving theoretical or conceptual problems, but required a kind of challenging of the learner's character of how they lived. Okay, so... Having rushed through those, those points as a bit of groundwork here, then I'm going to talk directly about three conceptions of education. I'm going to present you with something like ideal types in the sociological sense and as markers, if you like, for us to consider uh, different ways in which therapy might come into play. So, first of all, uh, I want to consider the idea that education is fundamentally a matter of the management of the reproduction of, psych of society. When I've talked about this before, I've sometimes made reference to a traditional conception of education. But traditional is far too loose a word. It just appeals to prejudices. I want to be more precise by talking about the management of this reproduction. So in the past, 50, 100 years ago, much education then was concerned to instill obedience and discipline to uh, uh, encourage respect for authority, conformity with established moral standards, teaching the three R's, and with passing on a body of facts appropriate to the national context. I don't think I should say 50 years ago, that's out of date, 100 years ago. Okay? Filling empty vessels with knowledge. But there's a contemporary version of this. Remember, we're talking about the management of the reproduction of society. And this is where the vocabulary has shifted from the imparting of a body of knowledge to students instead to the students acquiring skills and competences, learning how to learn, self-management, self-profiling, becoming aware of their own strengths and weaknesses, what kind of learner they are, and emphasising in OECD policy particularly student agency. Interesting word agency, it's not that, or not that common really in English, it's used in a semi-technical way here. And, of course, prioritising choice. The student will have choice in this process. Now, um, I'm not hiding the fact that I'm pretty hostile to what I'm describing here, and it goes with the kind of performativity the, um, uh, that we find proliferating in education in so many different contexts. And the notions of student agency and choice are depleted notions. Really, this is choice in relation to choosing the field which in within which you can become an efficient producer for society, the work you can do, and exercising choice as a good consumer. Um, and of course, we're encouraged to do that in so many ways. 
So it's feeding the continuation of the neoliberalism that we live in. So what's its relation to therapy? Well, therapy really is something extra to the mainstream of the curriculum, and it's needed to enable the management of stress and facilitate self-esteem and well-being. Those things are important because they'll help the students do better in their exams. They'll make them more efficient, more productive. I exaggerate, but I told you this was going to be an ideal type. Let's take a reaction to this, which I want to locate more in the middle of the uh, 20th century, at least in the 60s and 70s, in the form of progressive education, which was certainly reacting to the traditional kind of approach um, which it demonised, for good reason in many respects. And progressive education then takes a child-centred form, which was very much underway in the mid-20th century, which respects the fact that all children are different. They're not just empty vessels to have facts poured into them. They learn best when they're free. They learn from experience, not from the teacher. And their education is a process of unfolding from within. They develop exist we should develop existing motivations. Happiness and play are important. And an emphasis is placed on the imagination, creativity, self-expression, the feelings of the students. Rousseau and Dewey, great thinkers in the background to that, and then many others, Froebel, Pestalozzi, and so on, A.S. Neal, as time goes on. Okay. There's also, though, a recurrence of this vocabulary of not child-centred but student-centred education. This came to the fore particularly in community college, post-compulsory education, and adult education. And it partly was motivated by a concern to give students choice, to pay attention to individual students rather than just teaching them as a class, uh, waiting to absorb the, the facts, the information you're passing on. It was also connected to a vocabulary of empowerment. And we want people to be empowered. There's a good political reason for people to have more confidence in their own lives and their own ability to, to think and exercise choice in their lives, to feel they can do things. There was an element of consciousness raising, especially deriving from uh, Paulo Freire, who of course was in Brazil in the 60s, and strong emphasis on students' experience. Malcolm Knowles, in about 1972, coined the expression andragogy. He objected to pedagogy, which relates to Pais, child in, in Greek, and said we need a different theory because adults are different from children. They have experience. Evidently, children don't. Seems a bit odd to me, but um, he emphasised the difference from uh, ordinary education with children in schools. And finally, person-centred psychology deriving from Carl Rogers. Okay. Now, what's the relation to therapy here? Both of these versions I've just given you place emphasis on personal growth and emotional development as internal to the main work of the curriculum. So it's a sympathetic, it's, it's closely linked. Therapy is absorbed into this process, in a sense. Education contributes to a healthy, happy life. I should say that this version has certainly been vulnerable to cor corruption, because while the progressive educators could talk about choice and empowerment, so could the new class of managers coming into post-compulsory education who wanted to upskill people and really prepare them in this way. So to some extent, that got hijacked. Possibly this has been hijacked as well, because this was the stuff that was around in the 60s and 70s, in this country at least. And then by the time of the 90s, it was being used, uh, and, the, and the 2000s, it was being used in government reports and elsewhere, not to support uh, creativity, imagination, and so on for their own sake, but to support creativity and imagination, because these were important skills needed in business. Now, that way of thinking is really a world apart from what I've just been describing as the earlier incarnation. So, oh, how did that happen? So, I want to juxtapose against those, what we've just been saying then, the idea of a liberal education. So, notice that progressives were very much concerned with freedom, so also is liberal education, it's, uh, it's there in the title, isn't it? And again, I'm going to point to two orientations to this, which could live together, these two orientations, in many of its forms of expression. Now, one relates to liberalism in the familiar sense, which is roughly the principle from John Stuart Mill, 
that people should be allowed to live as they wish so long as they're not harming others. Of course that's problematic because everything we do somehow or other affects other people, but that's the detail of the system. This broad principle is one that I think most people I know adhere to, in, are sent to in some way or other. And very often this crystallised in the idea that rational autonomy was a key aim in education. If you're going to have freedom, if you're going to live your own life, then you need to be able to live it as richly and fully as you can by developing the forms of reasoning and judgment that will enable you to, re to, to live that well, to live it well. Okay, the other orientation goes like this, and this is more difficult to explain, I think. And I repeat that these two can live together. They're complementary rather than being in opposition to one another. This is a freedom from illusion in order to see the truth. So here, the emphasis is on initiation into forms of knowledge that are major parts of our common heritage as human beings, ways of thinking that enable to understand the world more richly. And it involves initiation into things that are worthwhile doing themselves. So 60 years ago, many girls were just taught keyboard exercises, typewriting. And, you know, that's OK, it will get your job. But it would be odd if someone found typing fascinating in itself, wouldn't it? The boys did carpentry. They were much better off in that respect. OK? So the curriculum should have activities that are worthwhile in themselves and th where these are intrinsically fascinating in some degree and where there is unlimited scope for the furthering of interest. If you're studying history, you never come to the end of history. You come further up the mountain, which means you can see further and you can see more of what you can't yet see properly. You become aware of problems you couldn't conceive before. And some of the inspiration from this came from Michael Oakeshott from the LSE, who talked about the conversation of humankind. He said mankind, but I've cheated because we tend to have converted that now. And Matthew Arnold in the 19th century talked about the passing on of the best that has been thought and said, in which he included what has, what has been thought and said in science, but there's clearly a very strong emphasis on humanities for the reasons I've talked about, I think, in connection with making meaning for, in terms of the world and in terms of making sense of your life. And finally, um, behind all this, there's the powerful image in Plato's The Republic, uh, the, the image of the cave, and Socrates' very rich description of this allegory. I'm just going to spend a moment describing this to you. Is time OK? Yes. Um, just a minute describing this to you then. I know some of you will be familiar with it. But in the allegory, uh, Socrates in, imagines that human beings are actually in a cave, in the darkness of a cave, and they're chained to, their, to the ground so that they can't move about. So I would like you to imagine that you're in this cave now and you're looking at this wall of the cave that's here. Behind you, up there where the clock is, is the mouth of the cave, and through the cave's mouth, the, the light of the sun is shining. There are various objects up there, and those objects get projected onto the back of the cave, and you see images of those objects. But of course, the sun moves, the, the weather changes, and so these objects flicker. They never quite are in the same position. They change. They're in a state of flux. Now, because you've never been out of the cave, You've always been there. You think that this is the world. You think that what you're seeing on the screen is the reality. So education, to cut the long story, pro, pro, strong story short, would, be, would involve you in turning around, turning towards where the light is. And initially, when you turn towards the light, it dazzles you, it hurts, so you turn away. <coughs> Gradually, your eyesight strengthens, and you become curious about what's there. You want to get out and you break away from your chains. And perhaps others are there to help you, to encourage you on the way. Perhaps also, as you struggle towards the light, towards the light you'll also <coughs> slip back down, because it's easier to be here on the sofa with the pizza watching TV, rather than climbing out of the cave in the way that I said. Now, there's endless examples of uh, videos that try to explain this, lectures that explain it, cartoons that make it funny. And I've sometimes con contrasted examples of these with students. There's actually not a great many good images, but I'm going to... Sorry, I should have put this line up, shouldn't I? On this conception, then, we're talking about, which incidentally relates to the German notion of Bildung in some ways as well. 
um, the relation to therapy is, is, is as follows. It is a therapeutic conception of coming to see things truly, coming to face reality, to accept the difficulty of reality, and to live with it well. So as I said, there's, you go searching for a long time to find some good images of this. And as you see, I didn't find one. <laughs> so what you learn from this is that all the people in the cave were men for a start. And they all had beards. But being a bit more serious, you can see they're looking at the images, these distorted images, which they mistake for reality. And actually, it gets worse than I've told you. Because apart from the light from the sun, someone's also built a fire, and that also is creating shadows. And what's more, they're going to trick you by holding up images of things instead of the things themselves. The sunlight's projecting images of things, but these are not real things. They're cardboard cutouts of horses and other things which they're deceiving you with. So for Plato, this, sorry, I should say for Socrates, he wonders whether art is a problem, because art gives us not real things, but images of things. And certainly fake news is a problem, which is part of our difficulty, isn't it? Okay. So we need to struggle away from that, struggle from those false images on the screen towards seeing the world truly. This is the last slide now, and as you probably guess from what I've been saying, and it's partly in tune with what was said earlier on, our education systems stand in need of therapy. They're the thing that's messed up. And I don't wish, as Lucy was stressing earlier on, I don't wish to deny the increase in problems uh, with the pandemic and perhaps a more general increase in problems in a crowded world. I don't wish to deny any of that. But our education systems, I'm sure, are part of the problem. We have aggressive testing regimes and a cr an increasing technicization of the curriculum, sometimes referred to as performativity. What I'm referring to is all this objective set setting making everything transparent, never allowing a class to develop of its own course. Everything must be planned. Everything must be measured. And all of this is steeped in a culture of achievement so that people are focused on getting better qualifications or grades in this or success in that, building their profile, just like Mark we saw earlier on. Um, confused notions of subjectivity and objectivity. I wrote a paper about this in the special issue that Emma referred to, if you're interested in referring to that, but basically it's a matter of separating the subject from the outside world, then thinking the outside world is fundamentally physical stuff, and then you get in a tangle over that and start to think that values are purely subjective. Superficial notions of mental health uh, in the ways that others are described far more articulately than I could do. Agents of governmentality, schools encourage us to be self-conscious, to profile ourselves, to manage ourselves, instead of just to live our lives. Governmentality puts together government and mentality, doesn't it? It works the same in French, so we're governing ourselves in a bad way, policing ourselves. And all of this is subservient to, or an agent of, neoliberalism. There isn't a big brother out there making this happen, it's, it doesn't work like that. It's rather something that's seeped into the general consciousness as to how we must understand our world. It's so subservient to neoliberalism, students to become good producers and consumers. And hence, it's really unrealistic about two major worldwide trends. You'll probably guess this before I put them there. The first one is that in many countries, young people now have poorer economic prospects than the previous generation did. And worldwide, you know, poverty is probably going to increase, isn't it, with the increasing population. And of course, the climate crisis. You know, is there going to be a future if we carry on like this? Then probably not. The schools are contributing to that. All the green policies, they're tiny things in relation to what I'm talking about. We're educating people to be good producers of carbon dioxide, I mean, produce more of it, and that needs to be stopped. 